World Denver is a nonprofit organization that connects Denver to the world. We do it through exchange programs that bring hundreds of students and professionals to Denver from all over the world. Through community engagement events featuring experts, authors, world leaders discussing the most important global issues. And through middle and high school education programs that encourage students to be more engaged global citizens. And the vision of World Denver is that Denver is a much more globally connected city where all people and all communities have an opportunity to learn about and engage with the world. Everyone has a place at World Denver if they care about global connection. I think for years I've been involved with World Denver and I've heard about the homestay program. And I was interested, one, um, to have my daughter have an experience of <laughs> having an international visitor um, and also to learn about other cultures. I found it really interesting to learn about different cultures and see why they're different but also the same and what connects us even across like the entire world. It creates a deeper understanding of each other and different cultures and opens up lines of communication and perspective and understanding that can only be useful for all manner of things, right? Well, we know that the world has some huge global challenges and we know that the answer to solving global challenges is global cooperation. We love showing that off at World Denver. We love showing off all the leaders. We love showing off that cooperative spirit that exists in Denver between businesses and nonprofits and government agencies. We know that as leaders, we have a lot to teach the world and we have a lot to learn from the world. We also know that in the meetings that we host through our international exchange programs, connections are made that lead to long-term, lifelong strategic partnerships and even more economic development for our city. We know that a global city is a thriving city, so every single day we work to make that possible. My favorite part was the interacting in the job shadowing placements and places. Um, and that was a great experience, met different people, and also like, I was really exposed to different careers and different parts that you can take in life that are mainly focused on STEM that I wasn't really exposed to. So I think that's the greatest and the, my best, the best part of this whole experience. One of my best experiences when I was in Colorado would probably be um, going up the Denver mountains to go see snow. And it was actually my first time seeing snow. So it was super exciting. In 2021, World Denver became the new permanent home of the World Affairs Challenge, a middle school and high school program with a 30 year history of engaging students in conversations around sustainability and encouraging them to become more engaged global citizens. There's so many ways to get involved with World Denver and to support international connection in Denver. First and foremost, you can become a member. Membership fuels everything we do. You can also volunteer, host international visitors in your home, whether it's through homestays or world dinners, or you can become a judge in the World Affairs Challenge. Everyone is welcome at World Denver. If you care about global engagement, if you know the power of international exchange, if you want to see Denver as a more thriving, globally connected city, we have a place for you and we hope you'll join us. Uh, good evening. Welcome, everybody. My name is John Krieger. I'm the executive director of World Denver. As you all just saw, World Denver is a nonprofit membership organization that connects Denver to the world. And we do it through exchange programs. We do it through community events like this one here tonight. And we do it through K through 12 education programs like the World Affairs Challenge. And we're really excited that you all are here tonight as we discuss what really is a topic, an issue, and a conflict that is shaping the world day by day and even hour by hour. Um, when I was a kid, uh, we used to have these things. They were called newspapers. You remember newspapers. And when something was happening in the world, you could go to an opinion page or perspective page. And on that opinion page, you'd get this incredibly nuanced, researched opinion. And then right below it, you'd get the opposite opinion. And sometimes we don't have that opportunity as much now. And so we believe at World Denver that that is a role for us to play. While we're a nonpartisan, uh, unbiased organization, we do want to present uh, perspectives and opportunities for people to learn more, 
and engage in the world, especially when the topics are as important as the one we're discussing tonight. So I'm going to encourage you all, and I know you all will, to approach this topic uh, as we will with a, as much respect as we can. We know that this is deeply personal for a lot of folks who are here. Um, we know this involves big issues and big topics, and so we're going to uh, uh, approach it with the respect we hope it deserves uh, and the respect that our speakers deserve too and the bravery that they have to come up here and talk about these issues. And when I, we approach this tonight, we thought, you see it's a conversation on the Middle East, and what we really thought we should do is kind of have that uh, dinner time conversation, that kitchen table conversation that we're all having. If we could watch these three brilliant minds just talk a little bit about the Middle East. And to lead that conversation, there's no better person I know, really uh, in Denver, maybe in the world, to lead it than uh, Mr. Greg Dobbs. So, so Greg Dobbs is a three-time Emmy award-winning journalist who for more than 20 years covered the Middle East, often, most often, in conflict and crisis. Um, he literally wrote the book about it, wrote the book about being a, journalism, a journalist in crisis. Um, and he's here tonight to help lead these two brilliant professors in a conversation. And so with that, I will hand it off to Mr. Greg Dobbs. Thank you all. Thank you, John. So what we're gonna talk about tonight are the implications uh, on the ground where the war is happening right now, uh, in the greater region of the Middle East and globally, the implications of this war. And here's the thing. Maybe three weeks ago, maybe a little longer, we had a Zoom call, with two Middle East experts, a few key people from World Denver and I, to talk about the program we would uh, stage tonight. And what's intriguing is we had no idea. Nobody could possibly have known what would happen between then, just a few weeks ago, and now. No one could see this coming, that an Iranian-backed militia would attack an American military outpost at the very northern edge of Jordan and kill three of our soldiers, injuring more than 40 more. Or that some US politicians would demand direct retaliatory strikes against Iran itself. We didn't know yet that the United States would several times attack uh, Houthi military targets in Yemen, or that Iran would lob missiles and drones into its neighbor Pakistan, or that Pakistan would lob some of its own back. Uh, we didn't know yet that Saudi Arabia would say, as it has since we had our call, that it is still open to the possibility of a relationship with Israel if there is a Palestinian peace agreement for a Palestinian state. But we also didn't know that the Prime Minister of Israel would say maybe more unequivocally than ever before that at least on his watch, that isn't in the cards. The only thing we know is something, as the Washington Post put it earlier this week, events on the ground are accelerating in a worrying direction. I mean, it's worrisome for the direct combatants, it's worrisome for the nations that have taken sides, which includes the United States, it's worrisome for the nations that could be drawn into the war. And it's dangerous because it continues to this day. There are implications for the alliances and the rivalries in the Middle East, which are constantly shifting. And there, of course, are implications for the security of the United States of America. And also, it's probably no exaggeration to say that because of shipping and and arms sales and other things that are considered of value to the world community, the implications are global. And that's why we're lucky to have these two experts with us tonight. On your left is Professor Micheline Ishai. Uh, she is the Distinguished Scholar and Professor of International Studies and Human Rights at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. And Professor Ahmed Abdurabu, who is also a professor and the director of the U.S. and Japan Diplomacy Program at the Corbell School. So let me begin asking you two a personal question. Since the war started on October 7th, which in a week will be four months, what have you been thinking about? 
what I've been thinking about is going to the beach. No, I just, um, <laughs> I've been thinking about October 6th. Can you hear me? I guess the Can mic has me? to be right here. Can you hear me? Yes. Good, thank you. I've been thinking about October 6th and how confused I might have been at the time about what, my, my own, uh, what was imminent. You have to know, in October 6th, we were at a moment in history where we were just the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, exactly 50 years. And I was thinking going to a, a restaurant with my family that, well, s thank God there is nothing happening at the 50th anniversary of the, of Yom, the Yom Kippur War. War. But then, but I, then was I was also thinking, also thinking you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking now, now um, um, looking, at, looking the at the region and the map, the map that is behind, behind you, you that, that things, things were, were you know, you know, quite, quite on the on eastern, the eastern front. front. How so? How so? So, so in Israel, in Israel they... they in Israel, in Israel I, I mm, right here. <laughs> in Israel, in Israel they, were they were celebrating the end, the end of, of a religious, religious holiday, holiday to God. And, and it was it Friday, Friday, October 6th. The day, the day and, 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 people, and people, hundreds, hundreds of, thousands of thousands of thousands people, thousand people, people were also preparing, also preparing, preparing, for, preparing for a mass, for a mass demonstrations, demonstrations that was that happening, was happening sort, of sort of weekly, weekly since, since the government, government of Bibi Netanyahu came to power in November of 2022. There was also, was also a time, a time where, where 4,400 4, young, young people were thinking, were thinking about, about going and were going, and were going to, a to a Nova, a Nova Peace, Peace Festival, Festival of Music, of music and, and enjoying, enjoying themselves. themselves. So really, there was no real concern. In, in the, on the Palestinian territories, in Gaza even, there'd, there'd been two truce, peace, truce that were been signed, one in 2021 by Hamas and Israel, and the other one, the same year, May 2023, by uh, Islamic Jihad and the Israeli government. So truly, when you think about a few months down the road, just nobody was thinking that anything was going to happen. In fact, 18, over 18,000 of workers from Gaza were moving back and forth to Israel to work in Israel in order to sort of relax a little bit the blockade. It is true that on the West Bank, there was a little bit more of an escalation because the Benjamin Netanyahu government, with its more ultra-right government uh, uh, party, were sort of serving more the interests of the settlers in the West Bank. As a result of that, there was an escalation of violence for the past nine months. And that day of October 6, there was a settler who killed uh, a Palestinian student. But aside from that, if you look beyond the region, it looks like a region that was very tired of civil war. You know, Iran, you were just mentioning Iran, had gone through one year of protest movements, the women's march movements, million people coming, siding with the Balochistans and many grassroots organizations and trying to weaken the theocratic regimes. You think about Lebanon, another country that ended up being also involved in the process and what's happening after October 7 was really in periods of crisis. The Hezbollah was weakened. Um, there was a caretaking government in Lebanon. So truly worn out government and states. Think about Yemen, which had just signed a truce, peace, truce uh, uh, deal with, with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, which had was in the process, at the cusp of signing a normalization process with thanks to the Abraham Accord with Israel. When you think about this, Yemen, yeah, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Iran, tired countries, not real, real compass, unhealthy economically and politically, for sure. Syria, Syria has gone through 11 years of civil war with 600, over 600,000 people who died, a major, major catastrophe, 14 million of displaced people in, since the civil war. 90 people died that day. Yemen also was another uh, humanitarian crisis that had come to an end. So generally speaking, when I'm thinking about October 6, the day before, just before October 7, which changed and was a turning point uh, about the, with, with respect to what would happen to the Middle East, People were just thinking about their own business, hoping for better life. Very few, almost no one, I think, 
had predicted October 7th. 6.30 that morning, the all Middle East changed. Hamas militant came to Israel, attacked 18 kibbutz and other uh, uh, area and sites. 1,200 people died in a very brutal way. And that shift everything. Ahmed, same question to you. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to claim that I expected, of course, the attack, but like, I guess many experts on the Middle East, like yourself and myself, would have expected that, you know, the Palestinians would have or would do something to change the, the status quo. Of course, I never imagined something as big as what happened on October 7. I mean, I'm speaking here of the scale. Am I audible? Okay. I, I'm speaking here of the scale. Uh, but anyways, back to the question. Uh, uh, on October 6, it was very interesting because I was visiting my wife. She lives in Michigan. And we decided to watch a movie. It was a Friday night. So we decided to watch a movie by the name of Golda. And this movie, uh, which is a very interesting movie, is, is it's not, not actually about the life of the first and last female prime minister of Israel, Golda Meir, but it's about the Yom Kippur War. Uh, and I guess it was produced, I mean, you know, to celebrate the anniversary of the 50 years of, you know, war and peace between Egypt and Israel. But there was this very important scene in this movie, uh, maybe for those who watched this movie would remember it. Henry Kissinger did fly to Tel Aviv or to Jerusalem and he met Golda in her house. And then he said, I'm going to fly from here to Egypt, and I want a green light from you to, for a ceasefire with the Egyptians. And she, she said, I have one condition. And one would have expected, you know, what kind of conditions if you're really negotiating a ceasefire. It should have been much more of like, you know, speaking about the troops on the ground, uh, some guarantees from the Egyptians or from the Americans, but she said something that I didn't expect. She said, and I guess this is not a fictional scene, I guess it, it really happened, which was, she said, I want the Egyptians to call us the state of Israel instead of calling us the Zionist entity, which was usually the term used and is still sometimes used by some Arabs addressing Israel. And I want President Sadat to address me as a prime minister of Israel, not the prime minister of the Zionist entity. That was very interesting to me because it made me realize, and again, that was still October 6. Nobody expected that next day everything would, have, would change. And I was just thinking that was the biggest concern of the state of Israel 50 years ago, that not a single Arab country recognized the state of Israel, including Egypt. But now, 50 years after, we have eight Arab countries officially recognize Israel. And most of them are very regional important powers. We're speaking here of Egypt, of Jordan, of the United Arab Emirates, of Morocco, and plus Saudi Arabia, which, yes, of course, they didn't officially you know, exchange ambassadors. However, they two or three weeks ahead of October 6, they actually received the president of Israel, not secretly, it was an official visit. He visited Riyadh and he was you know, just welcomed and received as a, a formal official. So I was just thinking maybe why Israel, after 50 years and after getting this recognition that the Israelis have been always looking for, why Israel is not giving the very same right to the Palestinians? So I was just thinking about, and so far this is a question I have in mind, what it takes for humanity to learn that, you know, their life is going to be better with peace instead of war and instead of zero-sum games? Whoever can answer that question will win three Nobel Prizes. Sure. <laughs> Let me circle back to something you said. You said you expected, you never expected the assault that happened on the 7th, but you expected that the Palestinians, particularly from Gaza, where conditions, I've been in and out of Gaza several times, are much rougher even than in the West Bank, that they would try to do something to improve their condition. Looking at it through their lens, what could that have been? Um, I, I maybe my expectation was not as a, you know, as a, the complex that really happened on October seven. That scale of a very sophisticated military operation by Hamas, because I didn't imagine. I guess nobody imagined that Hamas would have had such kind of, you know, 
weapons and technology and strategies, etc. But like I expected some sort of uh, an uprising. And again, I'm not claiming at all that I was expecting that to happen next day. I was just always expecting something to happen. Like I'm expecting the Middle East to catch in fire sometime soon because Middle Eastern countries have been governed, most of them, by, by authoritarian regimes. So it's a, a human nature that for 70 years you don't have a state, you're not recognized as a citizen of a state, You've been always living with this narrative of, you know, my grandfather's and grand-grandfather's land was taken from them uh, by the Israelis or by the Jews. So it's it's a human nature that you're going to explode. Again, I'm not speaking about Hamas specifically, but there is always this kind of like expectation that peace will never happen till there is a Palestinian, independent Palestinian state. Can peace even happen between? Can peace even happen between the Palestinians and the Israelis? Can there be a genuine peace, even if the fighting stops? That's another way of asking, is there any prospect that either or both sides could ever really live in peace anymore? Well, the, the answer can be twofold. Very few people expected that there would be an Israeli-Arab peace process ongoing since 1948. The first war of independence, Israel was fighting on five fronts. On five fronts. Uh, so, at the time, uh, the prospect of peace was not even considered a possible, but then came uh, Camp David I, in which Israel and Egypt signed a peace agreement, and later on, we had another agreement with Jordan in the 1990s uh, that was signed, and that created sort of a buffer around Israel where the peace process was conceivable. Later on, we know just more recently in the past five, ten years, we saw Abraham Accords, different rounds of it, uh, which included Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Oman, Morocco, South Sudan, uh, to create a sort of a new normalization process with Israel. So those were not considered 75 years ago, but they are possible, and they were possible, and, and, w and, peace, and we see the progress of peace moving forward. Could it be possible to see an Israeli-Palestinian peace process? Well, this is an old story. We know that since Oslo Agreement, there have been attempted, various attempted of peace processes that fail. But, you know, I am also a historian of world politics, and I, and I just know that sometimes it takes a much longer time to get people to just sit at the table and finally agree upon a peace process. It seems to me that we might have reached that very critical standpoint in which the stability of the region, so with the epicenters around Israel and the Palestinian territory, demand, oblige, begs the questions of how to move backward into sort of during the time of the Oslo Agreement and trying to learn the lesson from that moment and see how we can just move it forward. There's been conversations now, as we know, with the Egyptians attempting to talk about the third bodies which will come and occupy the Gaza Strips with a new Palestinian representative that could be more unified, maybe not Hamas, because Hamas is not perceived as potential legitimate in the Israeli eyes and also in the, in the Western eyes. But nonetheless, it could be a third body with Palestinian representative that would be unified this time. The last time in Oslo, the Hamas did not want to be part of the agreement. This time, if indeed Gaza is demilitarized, just as the Israeli government, or rather the IDF as well, wish to see happen, maybe then it's a new opportunity for those peace processes to start again. So I would like to think, despite the horrendous tragedy that we see as a result of October 7, both on the Israeli and the Palestinian side, that, that there is a moment for history not to fail to turn. And hopefully this time it will turn. Um, yeah, I agree that uh, I think this is the only way forward. And I'm not denying or downplaying the so many problems on the ground. You know, when, when you speak of the two-state solution, uh, you're going to fight each other about, uh, okay, what about Jerusalem? What about the refugees? I mean, the Palestinian refugees. What about this? What about that? What about the settlements? I mean, there are, it's not an easy process. However, in my mind, there is no way you can give or provide security for the Israelis, nor prosperity and you know dignity for the Palestinians without moving forward with a two-state solution. And you will always have 
the right wing on both sides who are always trying to hinder that. Hamas definitely, and I agree, Hamas definitely is not interested to uh, uh, recognize the state of Israel, even though they technically did back in 2017. Um, and I'm sure that there are so many Israeli uh, officials, including the current prime minister, who doesn't want to speak about the two-state solution. But again, at the end of the day, I guess this is the only way forward. And I guess it is very possible. Would you be willing, as pessimists, to concede that sometimes there is no happy ending to the story? I mean, could the animus between the two sides perpetually exist? I mean, let me tell you a little story. Years ago, actually, it was when I was shuttling with Jimmy Carter, to, which, where he was visiting many states in the region leading up to the Camp David Accords, and we stopped in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I was, I was doing a program for the ABC show called Nightline. And I, I was asked to explain why the animus, why such bitterness between the two sides, if you can simplify it that way. And I resorted to a cheap journalistic trip because I didn't have much time. I did man on the street interviews. In Jerusalem, I asked 20 or 30 young people, what do you, uh, Jews, what do you have against the Palestinians? And almost uniformly, their answer was, well, when Israel was created as a state in 1948, uh, the Jews pushed us from our homes. Then we went to Ramallah, which you can drive to if you don't have to go through the, uh, the, uh, the uh, checkpoints in about 20 minutes from Jerusalem. And I did the same thing with Palestinian young people. Asked them, and their answer was, because back in 1948, the Jews, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Israelis said the Palestinians fled rather than live next to us. And the Palestinians then told me in Ramallah, uh, they pushed us from our homes. Thing is, none of them had been born in 1948. I asked them when they were, how old they were. So now we are two or three generations past that. And the animus, if anything, is stronger than ever. Which is, comes back to the question, do you think there's a possibility that they just won't be able to get it together? No, if I, if, if I may. Uh, there will be uh, peace, and I'm sure. Why? Because nobody knows, maybe, or very few know, that the legitimacy of the Republic of Egypt, Egypt was a kingdom, was a monarchy, till 1952. And then the military took place after a military coup d'etat against the king of Egypt back in 1952, and the very legitimacy of this republic was made on one dream or one goal, fighting colonialism, imperialism, and removing Israel and free the Palestinian state or the Palestinian state from the river to the sea, which means you know, the Egyptians didn't recognize, not at the roots level or at the political level, never recognized the state of Israel, never accepted this fact, President Nasser, who was the second, technically the first president of Egypt, made his legacy over this you know, idea of we will never accept the state of Israel. The Arab nationalist movement was taking almost every single Arab country, was made on this idea that we will never accept the state of Israel. And till 1970, that was the case. In 1973, Egypt, fought against the Israelis. As soon as 1975, President Sadat of Egypt was trying to consider some sort of uh, dramatic change. I guess very few people back then would have expected that Egypt and Israel are going to normalize, and that in, in a few years after the death of Nasser of Egypt, we will see uh, uh, an Israeli embassy in Cairo and an Egyptian embassy in, in Tel Aviv. And of course, after Egypt did that, uh, 21 Arab countries expelled Egypt from the Arab League, and Egypt was badly boycotted, and Sadat was described by most of Arabs as, you know, uh, uh, some sort of a traitor, or, you know, an, a spy, or an agent for the Americans and Israelis, etc. But then he was right, and that was the only possible way forward. And as of now, Egypt and Israel have a good peace agreement. Maybe they call it a cold peace, because it's not like fully normalized, but at least there is no war, and at least there is an international agreement that is binding for each side. So I guess there will be, it takes a brave leader to, to just preside over the system here and there in order to take this decision. So if history is any guide, the impossible could be overcome. 
in, in my point of view, yes. Micheline, what's your opinion? It's not always true. I'd like to think in the op optimistic way as, as uh, Ahmed is. We, we, could, close. we could actually conceive, not that I wish to, but I could, conceive the fact that Israeli will reoccupy Gaza for a very long time because there is no one who wants to be there. It will, could conceive that there will be a return to the status quo ante before of October 7. And, and then more of the same will be there for a very long time because that's the nature of things since 70, for 75 years, of course. But there is an interesting thing, and allow me to just uh, add an anecdote since you gave us an anecdote. I, I was living during the Arab Spring in the United Arab Emirates. I was teaching in the politi top political Emirati echelon. Long story about my academic career. Uh, Interestingly enough, during the time, I kept asking some of the very rich Emirati, what is it, I mean, you look at the Gaza Strip behind me. This is a small strip, 30 kilometers, very, very small. What does, if you really want to fight Iran, why don't you just simply build along the shore of the Mediterranean coast, just beautiful hotels, make a tourist star, make it a Singapore, just, just why don't you? This is really the best way to get rid of the Iranian. So they look at me, that was my little coterie of people I was teaching, and they said, you're right, Micheline, you're absolutely right, but there is too much vested interest for not doing so. So when they said that to me, when I was told that, that was before the Abraham Accord. Now just look several, this is 2011, that's when I was there. Now think about now who, are, who have vested interest to see Gaza no longer under the, under the tutelage of Hamas, under the guidance of Hamas. It's precisely those same people who told me there is no vested interest, namely the Gulf countries. Gaza is the gem of the Iranian through Hezbollah. Gaza, as long as Gaza is under Hamas, Iran is there. So for the first time with the Abraham Accord, you can see why Gaza is the one strip that no one, Israel, Jordan, Egypt, the Gulf countries, which attempted to normalize, no longer wish to see Hamas occupy, I mean, occupy or, or manage. So I would say that now there is a vested interest not to see that happen, more than before 2010. Well, so I'm not rejoining his optimism, yeah. Uh, I'm sure the two of you, we're probably gonna have to run through after, uh, answers a little faster just to fit everything uh. in. Uh, so <laughs> don't, don't, ta don't tell us anecdotal <laughs> <laughs> uh, Both of you obviously have given this some thought. Concretely, practically, what's it going to take for the fighting on the ground in Gaza and the suffering of people in Gaza to end? The surrender of Hamas yesterday will end the war. Now, just simple as that. That's just a quick answer. More so, more, more, a more detailed uh, answer would be, as we all know, the Israeli have uh, occupied initially north of Gaza, succeeded in dismantling, at the very least, most of the operations of Hamas in the north of Gaza. Then it evacuated 1.3 million of um, Palestinians to the south, Gaza to the south. The Israeli have conducted uh, an operation that has attempted to uh, clean out, in quote, uh, Hamas militant in Khan Yunis and its surrounding. It's close to two weeks close to be done. And the last point, the destination, which will be complicated, if they, want, if they meet the goals that they wish to meet, will be to go to the Rafah crossing and continuing the last effort of dismantlement Hamas. That's what the Israeli government wish to do. Whether that's a good idea is a different question, but that is currently what's on the ground. Uh, you know, I, I think, and I'm trying to be brief here, and I don't want to be very philosophical, but like, uh, I always believe that Hamas is not just a military operation, it's not just a military capability, it's not just the fighters or the terrorists on the ground. Hamas is the idea. And the idea that is recruiting many people to Hamas, or at least to support Hamas emotionally, even people in Egypt and maybe some in Saudi Arabia or some in Jordan, etc., 
it's the fact that Israel does not understand the language of peace. Israel only understands the language of power. So let's be powerful and let's, you know, just use the same language that they can understand. Which means that even if that happens on the ground, I doubt that the war will be really over. The war maybe will be paused, but if you even destroy Hamas, which I doubt that can be possibly happen, you will have Islamic Jihad tomorrow. You destroy Islamic Jihad tomorrow, you have another rejectionist, Islamic Jihadi, whatever the name is, the day after tomorrow, and it will keep just going viciously. Would you agree that you're describing an ideological movement? You said Hamas is an idea. We all know what that idea is. But how about an economic argument? I mean, Hamas, I was covering the region when, when the Palestinian Authority basically abandoned Gaza. They abandoned Gaza. It was corrupt, and they were getting money from Western donors and from Gulf donors. And uh, I saw more German cars in the parking lots at the Bukata, the headquarters of the Palestinian Authority, than I ever saw anywhere in Germany. Uh, and so Hamas moved in and, with the help of their donors, uh, provided social services. And, uh, you know, if people have to make a choice, I think, between ideology and a meal on the table, they'll opt for the meal on the table. So I, I would concede that there's a, there's a reasonable possibility that if somehow the mechanics can work out and somebody can replace Hamas providing social services in what is now a much more difficult environment in Gaza, then there's a possibility that Hamas, while ideologically and maybe militarily doesn't disappear, that it's no longer, uh, no longer commands the support of as many people. Is that reasonable? Israel left Gaza in 2000 2007, five, six, five, whatever. whatever. So I, I was there. Yeah, okay. So we're talking here about almost 20 years, yeah. more or less. I mean... 19, 18 years. And the Palestinians didn't stop supporting Hamas in Gaza. Of course, I cannot imagine everyone to be in favor of Hamas. I know people, myself, friends in, in Gaza who, who hate Hamas for so many different reasons, but still, the majority, I claim, are in support of Hamas. Even though Israel was not there, of course, we can now argue if that was a real withdrawal or not, but anyways, there was never a single tank or... You know, except, of course, when there was, uh, when we had some sort of wars, uh, like 2009 uh, um, and 2014, etc. But that didn't stop Hamas, even though, including from Israel, food and electricity and water was just, you know, coming on daily basis, even though uh, we have, you said, 50,000 uh, workers. Uh, 18,000. 18,000. 18, so they were making good money and they were eating, and maybe they had some sort of stability, but that didn't stop them from supporting Hamas. Why? Because the economic situation, improving the economic situation is important, but it will never be an alternative for the dream of a state, an independent, sovereign nation state. It was remind me the story of a Syrian teacher I had in Abu Dhabi who told me that Abu Bashar al-Assad would never go away. That was during the Arabs. And the reason is because everybody loved him. And then I said, well, there's no election. And she said, well, there's no elections because we will love him anyway. And then we happened the civil war. So bringing back the questions about... I'm sorry, about, but wait, there wait is a, a second, difference a between loving and supporting. I'm not speaking of loving, uh, no, but, but, but supporting. Uh, yeah, but you know, okay. No alternative created situations where people think they love. The, the poll shows that before October 7, most people... Uh, people in uh, most Gazan did not support Hamas. In fact, it was very highly delegitimized. And there was a, the deans at uh, Princeton who actually made surveys about it, which was very interesting, showing that the polls would, was completely delegitimizing Hamas, that they would really would actually welcome an alternative, just as much as Israeli were not supporting the government of Benjamin Netanyahu on October uh, 6, were about 18% perhaps or 20% that would have gone an election and voted again for the same party. So very delegitimized processes and no alternatives. So it's very difficult to say that you would have a continuous support even after the war. Maybe during war there is tendency of unifying out of the same group, but after the war I would tend to think that if there were alternative, the Gazan would go for those alternatives. Which is? 
Well, if there were alternative, there should be. <laughs> I said the if, if there was alternative. I, at, at this point, my, my argument the is the world is counting on the Egyptian to actually bring together Palestinian representatives and create in something else in the PLO perhaps, but just sort of new representative that provide opportunity for Palestinian population in Gaza that were not able to vote since 2006, which means 18 years. That's quite a long time to actually talk about a love affair. This is Between. totally, um, if I may, uh, Micheline, if I may disagree, this is totally out of context. You don't have a state for 75 years, and you never voted in a single elections in your life. And it was only one time in 2006. So that was not, and is not, I claim, is not the issue in Gaza right now. The issue is we want, and we here means the Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank, we want to have an independent, sovereign state. Peace is important. Providing electricity and clean water and food is very important. But in my point of view, based on my very, I claim what is, what I claim is the understanding of the region and of Palestine, there will never be a real peace and a real alternative but a Palestinian state. And by the way, we can always make the argument that why even if in the West Bank, you cannot claim that the West Bank is taken by, by Iran, you cannot claim that Hamas is very strong in the West Bank as a Palestinian authority, but why the West Bank didn't get any better political conditions, even after you know, Hamas totally was crushed from there by the Palestinian Authority back in 2006, 2007, I guess the question to me is always this idea of achieving the dream of so many Palestinians, if not all, of having a state. Yeah, but I don't think that that's your point, right? Was it your question, Greg? Well, I, I'm going to ask a question about the Palestinian state, and specifically to you. Can you understand why Israel, why many Israelis, including their prime minister, but not just the prime minister, don't trust the whole idea of a Palestinian state? Um, I, I spoke with many Israelis, and at least the ones that I know as friends and some I consider families, they believe in the state of, of Palestine, but of course they, they have some sort of, like, of course, fears from, let's say, Hamas after October 7. If you ask, I imagine, if you ask Israelis, of course, no one in, would agree because they are all, like, you know, just perceiving Gaza and, and Palestine to be Hamas and, you know, a group of, a group of terrorists who are trying to kill them. Uh, but in my point of view, till 1990s, till Prime Minister Isaac Rabin, who was assassinated in 1995, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, in November 1995, it's, it always starts with a leader, not with the general public. The Egyptians, no one agreed or even thought of recognizing Israel back in 1970s. But it took a brave leader like Sadat understanding that let's put an end to this. And he did fly as far, of course, it's not far, it's a one-hour flight, but like in our you know, visual uh, thinking, it's far away to Jerusalem. And he made the peace. And the peace so far is there. Even though maybe so many Egyptians are still against it, but it is there. Okay. <laughs> as an Israeli-born woman, would you trust the security of a Palestinian state next door to the state of Israel? Not in these current conditions, of course not. Uh, uh, every, Microphone closer. Yes. The, there are many steps that have to be met before we get to that place. So the first step would, of course, be suppose that Hamas militant group is demilitarized, consistent with the goal of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. That day, there will be a vacuum. Who is going to take the Gaza Strip and control it. None of the Arab states wants to do that, none. They should, but none of them wants to do that. So in that vacuum, the most likely people who are gonna just probably gonna be in Gaza is the Israeli Defense Force. Not many is really like that. Some do, but not, the majority doesn't. They don't wanna send their kids to occupy Gaza. So you're in a situation you're asking, what will come next? Well, only if the Hamas is completely neutralized, dismantled, the command operation is collapsing, then you will have Arab states who can provide 
some form of help and assistance and management and reconstruction and so forth. And then, and only then, so we're talking about the long haul here, and only then when you have that group that is in the Gaza Strip, you will have the possibility to the Palestinian Authority or in other form, reformulations of it, in other configurations to manage the population. And only then, when there is unification of the Palestinian, can we talk about the peace process. So we are several steps away. I do understand the Biden administration wants to push that forward, rightly so. We want a political solution. No military solution is sufficient. But there are several steps, security-wise, as you were asking, that need to be met first. And without that, I doubt that the Israeli government will, will uh, concede anything else uh, short of that. Let's widen this out and ask this. Until and unless there is, and the unless is a big word here, uh, there is an agreement for a Palestinian state, do you see any prospect that the relationships that Israel had uh, created, developed with several uh, Arab states and uh, the budding relationship even with the, the uh, big elephant in the room, Saudi Arabia, could ever be reestablished until there is a Palestinian state? You know, I, my answer is as simple as most of Arab regimes when it comes to the, the Israel-Palestine card, are going to be very hypocrite, uh, including well, they the Egyptians. They always have been, yeah, truth be and known. they are still, and they will, uh, and and due to different dynamics. Like just one example in Egypt, there is a military junta, there is an authoritarian regime. So as of now, even though for years they have been calling Hamas a terrorist organizations, accusing Hamas Egyptians, accusing Hamas of supporting the jihadi-based, I mean the Sinai-based jihadi groups, uh, uh, so supporting terrorism in Egypt, all of a sudden, as of now, they are you know, calling the, Egypt, the, the Hamas, leader, uh, Hamas fighters uh, resistance, and they are celebrating them in, in the official TV, uh, I mean, official state-sponsored media outlets. So, the, the, and the Emirates already have a peace agreement, and I don't think they will withdraw it, even the Saudis were two steps away from signing a peace agreement with Israel, even though they knew that the Palestinian state was not achieved there. So my answer is, at the official level, I claim most of Arab regimes are ready to go for peace with Israel, with or without a Palestinian state. The problem will always be the masses, how to portray that, how to present that to the general public in Saudi Arabia or in Egypt or the United Arab Emirates. As of now, it's going to be difficult, and most of them will say, like Saudi Arabia is saying right now, we want a Palestinian state first. For both of you, what are your thoughts about Iran? Iran is behind Hezbollah, Iran is behind Hamas, Iran is behind the Houthis, Iran is behind some of the militant uh, anti-Israeli, anti-American cells in Syria and Iraq, okay. maybe also in Jordan. Do you have, I, you don't have a crystal ball, I fully understand that, but where is this going with respect to the involvement of Iran? This is a very weakened theocratic state, not only because of the protest movement, as I mentioned before, but it's also economically very, very weak. It is, a, it, it is I mean, 40% of the Iranians are below the level of poverty, part because of the sanction, but that really this is a suffering country. It's also scared the government, and that's the reason why they allowed only two parties to run, Conservative Party and the more purist party, and they just pushed on the sideline Rouhani, who is sort of more of a moderate, liberal, everything relatively speaking. He was the president during the Iran during the nuclear Iran talks. Yes, so we, we are in a situation where what we are seeing in Iran is a very, very, very tired government, a very poor economy, a, a, a protest movement with major crackdown and difficult to really contain. Uh, very difficult to believe that the Iranian have the capacity to keep going with the type of financial training, uh, financial assistance and training that they have done with, the, with their proxy countries, including Yemen, uh, the Houthis, Hezbollah, some of the paramilitaries in Iraq, Jordan and, and, and Hamas. Uh, they gave a lot of money, hundreds, thousands, millions of dollars went to Hamas from Iran. Um, 700 millions went to Hezbollah. 
this is, they, they give quite a lot of money, and you wonder how can they afford this on the long run. So I, I think that they are, they're finding themselves cornered a little bit. One can see that just recently as a result of the drones attacks on, on, on three troops, American troops, they are sort of trying to contain what they have done because they, they are not in measures to keep up the escalations with the United States. They're trying to just do some deterrence as a result of the, the war in Gaza, but they also realize they don't have the capacity not to con neither to control their proxy groups nor to really continue and sustain an escalation uh, with the United States, the Western Alliance, and the Arab um, monarchies, the Gulf monarchies. So I, I, I think that what I think about Iran is that it looks for next its strategy and it doesn't even know how to explain it. Ahmed? Um, you know, I, I think all authoritarian regimes are bad, but the worst are going to be the religious authoritarian regimes. Um, and I guess that the Iranian state and the Iranian regime is very fragile. Um, they have so many issues right now. Economically speaking, uh, the, the brightness of this ideology called the Islamic Revolution, uh, which I consider a lie, is now uh, you know, considered a lie uh, on the eyes even of the co very conservative community of Iran who used to support the Islamic Revolution before. They have a dying, almost a dying, uh, a spiritual leader uh, who, who, as you maybe know, is not just a spiritual leader, he's also like he presides over the entire political system in Iran. They have a real problem to answer the question of who's gonna succeed him should he dies or passes away sometime soon, which can happen anytime. So there is a theory in political science we call the smoke of war. So, you know, if I want to rob a house, I'm going to set a fire on the next one. So there is some sort of smoke so the neighbors will be just busy with the next door house and then I'm gonna, you know, just uh, break into this house. And so this is what exactly the Iranians are doing. They are using all the proxies, the houses in, in, in Yemen, the Hezbollah in Lebanon, and of course Hamas and Islamic Jihad in, in Palestine, because this is the only way they can survive. I am not naive about the power of public protest uh, I covered the Iranian Revolution, and that was a public protest that turned into a revolution that led to something not everybody wanted, but people got on the bandwagon at the time. Uh, but that said, this is a different regime than the Shah's regime. To what degree are they even vulnerable to public dissatisfaction? They are very vulnerable to public dissatisfaction. It's not just young people going on the street of Tehran. It's also the base of the theocratic regime. It's also the former supporter of the theocratic uh, government that is on the streets. It's also the Baluchistans who are on separations, the separatist movement in Baluchistan. So it's a quite a great level of discont discontent that is occurring right now for the past uh, year or so in Iran that is pushing uh, and squeezing the, 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 the regime. We'll see in March the election and, and that will be very telling to us as to see what is the road that will be taken. But there's not much alternative in the election. There'll be just two conservative parties that are running and of course there'll be a very low turnout probably as a result of that. Uh, it would be amazing if 40% of the Iranian populations would just vote uh, in the March election. So. I think that it's th they need help. It's pretty interesting to know what type of help they need. It's not enough. The, the West has not helped the supporters, the, the protester against against the Shah. Um, do they need uh, coalitions? I've always been wondering about these questions with the, the army, just as the protester did in the Arab Spring with the Egyptian military. They're almost missing that, it seems to me. But if they were to have more partnership with the military, I'm not talking about the Al-Quds, but sort of the, the regular um, military in Iran, maybe they will have the possibility to oust that regime. So a lot of questions. So. That said, since Iran obviously is the power behind the so-called axis of resistance, what does Iran want? Uh, they, they just want to survive as long as they can, because as I said, the lie is now clear right in front of, I claim, most of the Iranians, including the very conservatives, one who used to support the Iranian regime. I learned from the Egyptian experience that 
it's very simple to topple down a regime, but it's really hard to build another. This is the Egyptian experience. Um, so the Egyptians were able to topple Mubarak out of power, but they were not able to find an alternative, and Egypt ended up in what I claim even worse than Mubarak time with a military coup d'etat and a military junta. And, and then the alternatives before the Egyptians were like a military coup d'etat or an Islamic revolution. So they decided to go for uh, a military coup d'etat, which I, I guess I agree with Professor Ishai that uh, the nearest scenario for Iran in my mind is a military coup d'etat or a some sort of a military intervention should the current spiritual leader, uh, I mean, I shouldn't call him spiritual leader. So sh should the current leader, religious leader of Iran dies or passes away? because I see that there is no one that can alternate him. No one of the charisma, no one of who's really popular. So I, I guess the next step for Iran is, unfortunately not democracy, unfortunately not secularism, but it's gonna be another episode of authoritarianism, but maybe a different flavor, which could be a military coup d'etat, could be a military regime. Another question uh, to your crystal balls. Both of you spend time more than the rest of us studying the behavior and the motives of almost all the nations in the region, correct? So what would you guess is the prospect for a wider war? If economic interests were the driving force, none. <laughs> because we, as I said before, my preliminary remarks of what do you think, I was sort of just sort of trying to paint an image of the region in which each of the countries that are currently involved, whether it is in the axis of resistance led by Iran or the other side, but mainly the axis of resistance, everybody is, every country, every group is part of a government that is failing, an economy that is bankrupt, Lebanon, caretaking government, Syria, uh, in chaos, requires 88 billion for reconstruction. The amount that's to reconstruct Iraq with all its oil production is quite enormous. If you think about Yemen, this is this is sort of the, one of the most chaotic regions currently, with also an enormous humanitarian disaster. So, this, the spiraling, the escalations of the war is probably doesn't make sense. And again, going back to what I said before, it ca you know th there are a lot of war that's that escalate as a result of many accidents. <laughs> Those things happen, they just sort of right. multiply on each other and then suddenly you find yourself in you know, just a bigger war than anyone had expected. One misstep or one One misstep man. and it's just sort of a multiplying effect. But then it, there's this act of two. You have to sustain it. And the capacity to sustain on act of two is very, very slim. So I don't think that that will, or at least maybe it's a wishful thinking, but right now I don't see the sign for that form of escalation. As of just here today, we know that the Iranians are trying to show that the American they want to deaccelerate the <laughs> Iranian enrichment program just simply because they want to say, oh, we really don't want to be part of the game here with the, what the what uh, uh, al Hezbollah did in uh, against the three American troops. We, we just don't want to be part of this. There is signs that the Hezbollah, Hezbollah, which is the militant group which actually sent those those drones against those, those, those three American soldiers, said, no, we'll never do that again. Which is really funny, it's like a little child comes, I'll never do that again. Of course, there will be retaliation. But in any event, the point is that will that really get to the place of, of fear? We, there is, of course, in the world, a greater concern because of the war of Ukraine, and people are wondering with this sort of alliances now pitted against each other. In a way, they are repeating a little bit the Ukrainian alliance with some new actors. Uh, so, yes, I, the, the fear is understandable, and it's possible, but not very likely on the long run. If, if we think of the wars as traditional ones, where like states are fighting each other, uh, I agree that it's less likely to happen. Uh, however, the problem in the Middle East is you always have proxies. So I may claim that right now there is a wider war, Maybe the scale is not as high, but there is already a wider war. You have the Houthis are trying to target every single uh, uh, ship that is trying to make its way to, to Israel. Uh, 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 you have also the Houthis trying to uh, firing uh, missiles on Israel. Uh, you have Hezbollah. Uh, uh, you have you know uh, so many other jihadi groups in Egypt and 
uh, in Sudan. You have already a military coup in Sudan and a civil war in Sudan. Um, so in my, and of course Libya is another question, which is like a very, you know, fragile state. So my problem with the Middle East is not the a traditional wider war where let's say Iran is going to, to fight with Israel or Iraq is going to occupy Kuwait or it's much more of using the proxies, which is already happening right now, to target American interests, Egyptians, Israelis, uh, or to set fire, which means like sectarian wars, which always happen in the Middle East. And those this is proxies my concern. don't have the same concerns as sovereign states, do they? Of course, and the problem is there is no central leadership, and also the way you should contain them or fight them is, is not traditional because this is not like the Egypt-Israel war. You had two armies fighting each other, but, but this is different. So this is my concern, that the scale is going to a higher degree because we're talking here about proxies, not traditional, not traditional wars. I'm not concerned of, at all of, of a traditional war, uh, that let's say Egypt attacks Israel or Iran attacks Israel or Israel attacks, I mean, this is not the case this time. It's much more of using the proxies by Iran or by someone else, which is very possible, and it's already there. We know that the United the States, in the physical form of President Biden, when he flew to Israel not too many days after the massacre, uh, has embraced Israel. Uh, Biden has cooled off with Netanyahu, but nevertheless, the United States has associated itself with Israel very strongly, very directly. Um, we know what that does in the short term to American interests in the Middle East. What about the long term? Uh, well, it depends how, the, how what unfolds as a result of this uh, partnerships uh, since since Biden has has come to Israel uh, soon after the massacre of October seven. It is very clear that behind the door, Biden makes, despite of his disagreement to in front of the media. It's very clear that he wants the demilitarization, the neutralization of Hamas. That is actually what he counts on, even for his own election. So I, I, I d talking about Biden and not just the bigger questions which we were asking, I, I, I do think that the interest of, of Biden himself is to see a resolution of that war and then the next step before the campaigns resume in full fledged. The long term, uh, the long term interest of the United States is to find more than just stability in the regions, but also to create a front that would deter the, um, the spread of Iranian influence, which is dangerous in the region. Iran is backed by Russia. Iran is also backed by China. So we have here an alliance of a very liberal democracy and governments behind Iran. And there is these days, in sort of that global scope of what alliances are, a, a fight the United States may wish or not wish to take, undertake, but is probably now a resumption of its interest in the Middle East in order to deter those bigger forces that are quite alarming. Uh, please. I mean, it's to be honest, I don't have sometimes, it's, you have to be honest and you have to say I don't have an answer, which I don't. Th the point is, United States did try everything in the Middle East, and nothing worked. So during President Clinton and even before him, Bush 41, they were thinking of, okay, let's establish a Palestinian state, let's end this Arab-Israeli war, that's the American interest, and they failed, as we know, by the end of 1990s. Then Bush 43 thought that maybe it's a democracy promotion program, and he started to push and pressure many regimes, including Egypt, to open up and politically reform, and it didn't work. Uh, you know, the military was used and in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and it didn't work. And uh, to, to be honest, sometimes I'm very confused about what the Americans should really do in order to, you know, preserve peace and, and, and national security and regional security, which is still very inseparable from the American national security, so I guess my very, again, short answer, not the, the real, I mean, not the one that I'm confident of, which is at least pushing for an independent, sovereign Palestinian state might be, might be, I'm not sure, might be a step in the right direction. But again, I'm not sure because that was 
already attempted before and it didn't it didn't it's been attempted it wasn't by enough. every american president really since eisenhower to one level or another every american president has tried to come up with a solution to the animosity and the conflict in the middle east all have failed it's it's very true unfortunately yes uh, john krieger i think we have questions from the audience. Um, we uh, do, uh, uh, um, yeah. and we have quite a few, and they're really fascinating. Um, thank you all for these questions. And as you can see, there's both cards, QR codes at your seats, and then here up on the screen to submit uh, questions as we go and continue through this conversation and bring you all into the conversation. And you really see them uh, coming into the same types of buckets. And you all were just really kind of moving in this direction already. So we'll start with a question that I've seen several times, which is around the role of global players, including Russia, China, and the European Union, uh, in the peace process or just generally in the conflict. Is, uh, sorry, I didn't understand. It's the statement, or is it? So, what is the role? What is the role? What role are they playing, or maybe potentially what role could they play uh, when you look at European Union, Russia, China, and we even have a question about Latin America as well. <laughs> I, I'm pr probably more humble in, in my way of thinking about this. I think that uh, should there be a peace process, which is one that I, of course, would favor. I, th should there be a peace process, and that's the one that I would certainly favor, would be one that will initially bring together the current players in the, in the, in the situation, and that would be um, the, the Israeli, uh, a new Palestinian representative, uh, the Gulf countries, which have already been very interested, the, the, the Egyptian, uh, certainly the Jordanian, the European Union, the United States, the role of Russia, I don't think so. They're very busy with Ukraine. They should stay there. Uh, Iran, certainly don't want them to be in the pictures of a peace process because they are going to be removed. The idea is to remove them from Gaza, so they should not be part of that peace process. Uh, so a, a much uh, probably smaller uh, cast of character to bring uh, uh, about this peace process. And of course, the strong mediation of the United States uh, would be very important. With full, full confidence, only the United States can solve it. I don't see any rule for the Chinese, even though the Chinese are recently trying to play different cards in the Middle East, which is the political arm. Uh, for example, they, they were able to mediate some sort of a peace between the Saudis and the Iranians, and they were successful. But again, I don't see any country, any superpower. I mean, we can speak, for example, of reconstructing Gaza. Of course, we can speak of EU money or, you know, maybe Chinese money, but no one will be able to solve this politically but the United States of America right now. Why not Russia? For two reasons I asked. Number one, Russia used to be the factor in the Middle East in the 60s and 70s until the US replaced it. And Vladimir Putin, if he wants nothing else, he wants his nation to be a superpower again. And this is one place where it could, might play that role. And number two, because he has alliances with some of the players, whether you like them or not, uh, that we don't have. He has nothing but propaganda. I mean, if you look at what cards he can really play in order to bring stability or peace or any rule in the Middle East, nothing except media propaganda, which is his, his playing very well with the Arab world right now, like speaking from the Arab side, of course, many Arabs now are in favor of Russia because they think that the Russians now all of a sudden are speaking of you know, the rights of the Palestinians to, to have a state, etc. So, But I think it's, it's just a propaganda card. He has nothing really to do. He's very, very stuck in, 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 in Ukraine and this is his biggest concern right now. So the next question, and again, this is one that we've seen uh, over and over throughout uh, this evening, is about proportionality. So the proportionality of the uh, Israeli response, and particularly what laws, uh, obviously we know uh, the South African claim, what laws are, come into play, and how are how is proportionality judged in the international in international law? 
But it's a two different question, how mm -hmm. it's judged in international law and, and the case of the Genesis. International Court of Justice, the ICJ. So uh, the question, the proportionality argument suggests that a state has the right to defend itself, itself proportionally when it targets military and for its advantage, for military advantage. Uh, the issue of uh, civilian casualty can, can happen, will happen in, in armed conflict, but only and only if the state has targeted, the, 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 the defending state is attacking first the military target. Okay, that made a little that complicate. Going back now to the ICG, uh, question. Make it clearly that the, ICE, the, the, the South African brought an allegations against Israel that it was committing a crimes of genocide. That was what the South African allegation. The ICJ ruling was not that it did so, but it was sort of a provisional measure that the Israel should undertake in order to reduce uh, lack of humanitarian assistance or incitements of leaders against against um, uh, the Gazan people, and uh, but it 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 stopped short of accepting uh, the the ending of the ceasefire. So uh, to make a big uh, th so th that is. The, the, the issue of proportionality was not really discussed there, but really what the ICG was attempting to do, with different sides seeing it very differently, was to just create a situation where the United, the Israel would not um, conduct act that could lead to genocide. That is sort of the wording, right? They, of course, the South Africans uh, weaponized that, said that they won. The Israelis said it was obscene, that Hamas was the one that was committing crime against humanity, and they were just retaliating. The issue of proportionality, according to the Israeli, is not excessive in light of the law of armed conflict. Where in armed conflicts, casualty can exceed the number of people that die in Gaza. Not that it should. That's a normative argument. I'm not entering the normative argument. But, but, but you have casualty in the war of Yemen, 350,000 people die. Uh, in, in Syria, 650,000 people die. So the casualty is very, very high. Uh, the issues of, you know, the, nobody took the, the Syrians in, in the ICG for crimes against genocide. So uh, people tend to forget that the number of deaths is not always a crime against genocide. The, 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 the conventions of the genocide, the prevention for genocide, as a different bar, and people sometimes confuse the two. So. Uh, we, yeah, we, I agree that we're talking about two different things, the genocide and, generally speaking, the if there are war crimes in general. And let me claim that I with the genocide thing, I guess it's a very technical question. We're not sure. I'm not sure, and I'm not... To be honest, I don't know if that was really done. Of course, it's not just about the number of deaths. Of course, there are some political statements that South Africa is using against Israel, statements made by Israeli officials after October 7, like when the Minister of Defense, uh, Yoav Golan, said that you know all Palestinians are human animals, uh, like when uh, the Minister of Interior, uh, Ben Gafir, said that uh, you know Israel is considering to use a nuclear weapon. Uh, 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 in Gaza, so they are using these political statements to make this argument of genocide. However, my, my other concern is the war crimes. And I guess there have been war crimes committed, not because of the number of deaths, but because of the collective uh, punishment strategy that is officially adopted by the Israeli army or by the IDF uh, in Gaza. However, and to be honest and to be fair, I guess that Hamas did also commit some war crimes on October 7th, that's for sure. If we're, if we're talking about the Nova uh, Music Festival, if we're talking about, I have seen videos myself of Hamas, uh, you know, going from one house to another in the kibbutz, killing people who are civilians who were not actively fighting them. And some of them were even uh, shooting at uh, an ambulance, like, you know, tires. So it, it was, it's clear to me that Hamas has committed war crimes, but also it's clear to me that Israel has committed war crimes. And again, it's not about the number of deaths, it's about the principle of collective punishment. I think to be clear, the word genocide means, as I've read it, an intent to wipe out a population, a religious population, an ethnic population, national 
population. Uh, you know, one could argue that as many people ha as have died under Israeli strikes, uh, that it's something on the order of 1% of the Palestinian population in Gaza, which would suggest that it's not an effort to commit genocide. So uh, as I'm saying, what South Africa is using, and I'm not sure if the ICJ will finally agree with them or not, but what South Africa is using is a different argument. South Africa is using the official statements made by official incumbent Israeli uh, uh, politicians and, and can military I, leaders. Can I just, just respond to those uh, claims? The, the statement that were made, whether by Galan, who actually has called for um, non-occupations of the Gaza Strip, and also Ben, ben Gvir and, and Smotrich, you have to remember that those two parties are in the minority of the World Cabinet, and they are not representative of the World Cabinet. And so that's very important. People tend to forget that and confuse the World Cabinet with the larger coalitions. So that, that is, as respect to the other part, that is not incitement by humanitarian assistance. Not, no one else but the, the Egyptian knows how Raf, Ra, the Rafia crossing is opened up before, during October 7, just a week and two of during the October 7, to bring actually food. Fuel was the one element that was restricted because it could be used for Hamas under the tunnel, for the, for the operations of Hamas under the tunnel. But there is very little evidence that it is really with a partnership with the Egyptian, we're not bringing humanitarian assistance, maybe not enough, and that's in that sense the court might have pushed Israeli to reopen a little bit more humanitarian assistance, but there is very li little evidence, and that is critical if one wants to make a statement that there was a crime of genocide. So if the documents are not there, if they're not verifiable, then you have to call it differently, and maybe the ICC court would have been the one where those allegations should have been brought up, but not the ICJ. I know we don't have much time, but just a very, very little argument. From the international law point of view, it doesn't matter if they are members of the uh, war government or defense government, or if they are member of the wider cabinet. It doesn't matter. From the international law perspective, they are decision makers. We're no. talking about the Minister of Defense, aren't we? Well, Gallant is actually, Gallant, Eisenkart, and, um, um, where am I missing? Gantz, and uh, are the, the main military chief of staffs who are sort of operating and strategizing so about the war. They are not making those statements. There are people who make such statements. So you have to actually wonder if the war cabinet is not doing any act that is really, it's very easy to see from the, the, the map that you just were showing before. Three weeks after the war, October 7, when the, after the massacre, 1.3 million of Gazan moved to the south. Had there been an interest of exterminations of the Gazan people, first of all, there would not have been three weeks of, uh, of, of wait. And secondly, there would be aircraft and bombing keep, keep go that would have gone forward halting the possibility of Israeli incursions in the north of Gaza, making the war much easier on the Israeli side. So obviously the operation of the war, and I'm not trying to suggest here that what's happening to 27,000 Gazan is, makes sense from a humanitarian perspective, of course not. What I'm trying to suggest here is that the claim of genocide is not warranted from what we understand to be the conventions of genocide, the prevention of genocide. That's all what I'm saying here. Uh, okay, just a little reminder, the Convention on Genocide is also speaking about the intentions, not just the actions. Well, it is a connection between intention and action. If you have a couple of people or some people who are saying something and the actions do not corroborate, then you have a problem. Next question. Well, well thank you. <laughs> and uh, I want to ask, as you are both professors, we obviously see among young people uh, what's a growing a sentiment of support for Palestinians. Is that generational? What are you seeing and hearing from your students and from students that you interact with? Is that uh, exclusively here in the United States or is that across the entire, across the entire globe? That's a very good question. There is a generational component for sure. I mean, think about people who have experienced the state of Israel in 1948, the baby boom generations who might have gone to the kibbutzim, have actually looked for, uh, so Israel struggle against attacks of Arab states. They have a different understanding of Israel. 
and think about the new generation, the Gen Z generations, and sort of Ezra Klein was sort of making a similar argument. The, the Gen Z generation, what did it see for the, you know, with the 10 years, the long tenure of Benjamin Netanyahu in government? Inability to start or rekindle the peace process, occupation in the West Bank, affliction and grievances of uh, Palestinians in Gaza. That generation is, like, rightly so, but also myop myopically so, focusing only on that part of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and less so about the long history. So different generations will have different attitude, and it's not surprising why the baby boom generations tend to be more supportive in this country toward Israel. Republican and Democrat, the young generations tend to be less, so three, three out of ten, uh, according to some survey. Um, Sorry. You're the expert. On uh, no, the just very briefly, uh, just very briefly. You know, I have uh, students from, uh, you know, an, an Arab background, from an Israeli background, or Jewish background, from, uh, you know, just white American kids, and so. But, and I guess, in general, they are confused. At least in in, in my own expect, I mean, in my own observation, they were very first against what Hamas did, of course. But then later on, as the war started to unfold, and the you know images coming from Gaza, they started to turn against, to turn against Israel. And I don't think, or I, I'm I'm not sure if they have a very solid opinion whether to take this side or that side. In general, they want peace, which is very understandable. But there is something I want to highlight here, which is very important. Uh, in, in my own experience with my Jewish students, and some of them have family in Israel, so it's very emotional and very uh, personal to them. Uh, they, they really feel, and, and I have, even if I agree or disagree, it doesn't matter. I'm their professors, and I have to understand their emotions. There is this growing feelings among my Jewish students that there is some sort of targeting or targeted actions or behaviors or statements against them as Jew. So there is this idea among them that is widely shared right now that anti-Semitism is there. And again, if I agree or disagree, it doesn't matter. These are emotions. And sometimes as a professor, you have to deal with emotions. And all I do is I just try to differentiate between standing with the right of Palestinians to have a state and being anti-Semitic. In my point of view, two different things. If you're calling for the genocide of all Jews, like liberating Palestine from the river to the sea, of course, that's some sort of what I may consider anti-Semitic, because yet now you're, you're technically calling for the genocide of 8, 10 million people there. And it's a colloquial term that comes from the Hamas charter. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, quick question, because you said students shifted. Originally, there was a lot of support for Israel and sympathy after the massacres, and then it shifted. Would you say, from your conversations with them, either of you, that that's primarily because of Israel's approach to its uh, campaign to eradicate Hamas, meaning the massive airstrikes, the de destruction and death? Yeah, in, in my case, yes, especially seeing the ch children, women dying, and uh, maybe some political statements by, made by some Israeli officials. Uh, yes, I guess this is why they started to shift. The humanitarian part of it is what shifted some of their opinion with regard. Again, that doesn't suggest that they are now in support of Hamas at all. It's just that the idea that we understand that Israel has a right to defend herself, but again, there should be some sort of limits or well, limitations. You could be in support of a movement or you could be against a movement. And they can be two different I, things. I, I think that many students did not know what Hamas is. And so, and they often associate the occupations with the national, as, as so Hamas as a national liberation movement not knowing the history of its charter, of the fact that it was a spoiler in all peace processes, all over the attacks or inability to just unify with the Palestinian Authority. So there, is a, there, there was sort of that lack of understanding and knowledge. And unsurprisingly, many, without even knowing the level and the scope of the massacre of, of October 7, sided right away with Hamas in a way that was surprising to people who knew more about the history of Hamas and who knew exactly what type of entity it was and how um, it was not good doing a good job on behalf of the Palestinians to begin with. So we did see that. And we d I did not see as what you say, that, that level of understanding of the massacre. It didn't take long, really not very long, for the shift 
It, because already, even though there was a three weeks before the incursions of Israeli troops in Gaza, people already just completely siding with the Palestinians with an understanding that the occupation was the reasons of why that happened, without making a distinction between the occupations and the, and the attack against Israel on October 7th. Question to both of you, and I'll ask for a brief answer, even though you deserve to have more time than I'm going to give you. Does each of you uh, frame this in some way as the good guys and the bad guys? Never. <laughs> you know, it's in, in what I teach my students is like, it's always easy and, and less painful to think that, you know, this life is about bad versus good, evil versus, you know, good. I mean, and unfortunately in the Arab, at least I can, I can speak of the Arab side of the story, it's, it has been always narrated like that. You know, I, I, I grew up in Egypt in the 1980s. I was born in 1980s, that's already a peacetime, and I'm sorry you asked for a short answer. But you know, I grew up with very anti-Semitic Egyptian propaganda. So, and, and, and till very, I mean, maybe 10 years ago, I was thinking that all Israelis and are bad, and you know, they are all evil and mean, and, and it's not true. So no, it's not about good and bad. Each side has a narrative, each side has a background, and unfortunately, life is more complicated and painful than just white versus black. My parents were born in Egypt. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Alexandria and Cairo. So that very cultural experience is not one that leads me to ever speak in the terms of good, bad. I go beyond good and evil in my co comment and understanding. No, people are people. They just want simple things. They want their basic rights, you know. They want to have political representations just because they need it. They want economic ability to live in a way that is decent. They want civil protections and they want some security protections and cultural capacity. And hope. And this is usually universal regardless of where you go in the world. I don't think it's a Western exceptionalist argument. It really goes everywhere. They don't get it, and as a result of that, they fight. There's sectarianism, and there is misunderstanding, and there's political manipulations, and authoritarianism, and all that. So that, that, that is confusing a lot, the picture. But I think that people, when you really ask them, really what they are, pretty much that. So that is my own experience traveling in the region. So I cannot speak in those terms. I wish. Bad decision, yes, but not bad, bad people, too. But Thank you both for being frank. Thank you. Yeah, and then we have several questions, quite a few, about the New York Times report that UN workers assisted in the attacks of October 7th. Uh, in your you know, analysis, have you, what the credibility of those reports, and then also what does that say about the UN as a body? Okay, two distinctive questions, the UN as a body and, and the UNRWA. Uh, um, th the one thing I knew, and it was documented by hostages that were released from Hamas, was that one of them indicated that she was in a house, and next door there was kids, and, th and then the, the, the guardian of the hostage was, uh, had the helmet from UNRWA. So th th those documentations already had happened, that there were UNRWA, uh, that is the United Nations uh, Relief uh, Agency in the Palestinian area. Uh, for those who don't know the, the acronym. So there was already indications that there was some of those workers that were working for Hamas, not just for Hamas, but were really very close to what had happened to the, the massacre. I have not yet succeeded in documenting to what extent that happened. I do understand that that would be a major loss for the Palestinians who would really need humanitarian assistance, and I hope that something can be concocted very fast to fill that vacuum. And, and just very short answer, uh, even if it's proven that some of them have been part of this, they should be penalized, they should be fired, and even jailed. However, you know, the subsidies and the fund that is going to UNRWA shouldn't stop by any means. Because again, this is another way to collectively punish the civilians in Gaza because of the, uh, you know, what two or three or ten even did. And this will be our last question, and it's one that, not surprisingly, uh, we are seeing over and over and over here, and it's about the future. So what do you expect to see in the region in the future? And what do you hope to see in the region in the future, let's say in 20 years? Oh, I like that question. 
In 20 years? Okay. Nobody can, uh, can... Okay, I like the 20 year question. So I've written a book in 2019 that was published in 2019. It's called The Levant Express. And my publisher asked me exactly that question. He said, you can't talk about the Arab Spring. You've got to think ahead. I said, well, how far ahead? He said, 25 years. I said, beautiful, 25 years ahead. Let me try. So I did try, thinking that it would be the end of my career by trying to write anything on this issue, but I, I, I did. And one of the things that I came up with, I think it's still interesting and might have longevity, I, at least I hope. I, I'm a, I, I drew my lessons from history, and to me, the one crisis major on a global scale that, that, that really got my attention going was the World War II. 80 million people die in World War II. 80. Let's not forget, not six, 80. And what happened as a result of the animus that you were suggesting before? Well, they succeed in overcoming it. How? Well, they create an economic interdependence first, a European Union, a New Deal, a Marshall Plan, a Bretton Wood, NATO security, um, United Nations, um, a variety of mechanisms to stabilize the region. Something that nobody would ever think that the West would ever arrive to that place after a too large war. So for those pessimists among you, please remember the European got it, right? Not quite. There's a Ukraine problem. Hungary, okay. But nonetheless, 75 years. And, ho and how do you transcend the animosity between people? They're not going like to like each other tomorrow. We know that. You're going to tell them that our economy is interdependent. That's what the Europeans said to the, each other, the German and the French who couldn't stand each other. You're going to have a European economy. You're going to have a Benelux, you have a European economy, etc. It's going gonna, it's gonna to just transcend the hatred that has gone from one generation to another. Well, I took that lesson and I tried to apply it to the Middle East. I couldn't find out what would be the FDR ideas of creating new mechanism and large economic you know, Tennessee Value Authority, large, but then I start thinking, and then I discover it in one museum in Haifa, and it was the Museum of Railroad. There used to be, what did I see in front of me? It's a major cut map of the region, and you know what was on the map? A railroad that connect every country, every country. Who did that? The Turks, the French, the Germans, they put together that railroad called the Hejaz, used to go from Damascus down to Mafraq, Haifa, Baghdad, all over. And I said, what went wrong? The optimist or the pessimist among us, what went wrong? So I start thinking, we need a new railroad. Why? Because it will create mobility between people. It will cre create job 40%, 30% during the Arab Spring. It will create possibility to move freight, commodity, people reconnect another Middle East. So I got stuck to this idea. Everybody thought I was crazy. And before the attack of October 7, there were three articles, one The Economist, one in the New York Times, and then ultimately one that was translated in the Memorandum of Understanding of Biden in front of his desk, came this idea of a new railroad, don't know where it came from, from India just till till the Mediterranean Sea. I said, oh, wow, I may have had an, an influence, but maybe I won't take the credit right now. But the idea was to offset the China Belt and Road and Belt Initiative. Well, that's a good idea. It creates job, it creates communications, and it transcends sectarianism, old religious animosity. Now, I only hope that that idea has come back at the table of Biden or the whoever comes next, hopefully Biden, because hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want. So, uh, and this is on my positive note, optimistic note. Uh, on the short run, uh, I have a very personal wish, which I guess I, I talked with Micheline about before. Uh, maybe let's say in the coming five years, I hope my next sabbatical is going to be in one of the Israeli universities where I'm going to be in, in, you know, in direct contact with Israeli people and understand them much more. Uh, which I didn't so far. Uh, however, on the long run, I just want and I hope to see a normal Middle East. 
And by the way, when we speak of a normal Middle East, it's not just about the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Hamas-Israeli conflict. Of course, this is one, and I'm not downplaying the, the tragedy of the Palestinians, but also a Middle East that is free from authoritarian regimes, from religious authoritarian regimes, from secular authoritarian regimes, from sectarian wars, from proxy wars, just a normal Middle East. I, just, I lived in Japan for a long time. And I lived in now, in the, I lived now in the United States for nine years. And I just wonder, what's wrong with the Middle East? Why it's not Japan or the US? <laughs> normal people here and there, but the Middle East is not normal. And I, I really hope one day it will be normal. And, and definitely I'm, I'm optimistic that hopefully one day, I'm not sure when, but I hope one day. But that was the goal, the collective goal of the Arab Spring, and it didn't last. Yes. And I was, you know, myself, I was a victim of that. <laughs> Because I decided to leave Japan and go back to Egypt thinking that Egyptian democracy is a matter of time. And then I, uh, I was wrong. <laughs> well, I want to, first off, in the largest terms possible, thank our speakers and our moderator. Thank you. Um, and, and before uh, we convene, uh, there's just a couple of other small acknowledgments, well, big acknowledgments, but done quickly that I'd like to do. First of all is to our hosts, the Rocky Mountain Public Media Center, or sorry, the Buell Public Media Center, and the folks in the booth, uh, the command center over there. Um, I also want to recognize and acknowledge uh, Jeremiah Berenberg and Ambassador Catherine Eber Gray, two World Denver board members who had a huge hand in putting tonight's event on. And then uh, I especially want to acknowledge a World Denver staff member, Talia Reynolds. Uh, folks who know Talia know that this issue is extremely personal. This region is very personal to her. She put in enormous amounts of work around this event. Um, she is also just now celebrating her five-year anniversary at World Denver, making her the longest tenured <laughs> staff member. And. Um, to know Talia is to know that she is really the heart and soul of World Denver, and we're so lucky to have her. So folks, I will say, um, as a quick reminder, that uh, World Denver hosts one of the largest International Women's Day events in the country on March 8th at the Denver Center for Performing Arts in the morning. That day will start with a panel on global women's public health, and then we will have our celebratory luncheon in the Sewell Ballroom. Uh, it's going to be, as everyone knows, an incredible celebration. We hope that you all will join us. The reason I bring it up today is because individual tickets for that event will go on sale this Monday, Monday the 5th, for World Denver members, the 7th for the public. So it's a good idea to get a World Denver membership because this event will sell out and sell out fast. I thank you all. John, may I make a final observation? Yep. Do you mind? Yep. Do you have time? I mentioned when I introduced the topic and the speakers that we had had this Zoom call three or four weeks ago. Imagine this. If we had scheduled this program for that same night three or four weeks ago, it would have been different. It would have been incomplete. So much has happened between then and now. And if we had scheduled it <laughs> for a week from tonight, particularly in view of uh, the probable American response to the death of the soldiers in Jordan, it'll take a different shape, or it would have taken a different shape than this took tonight. That's how fast things are changing, and that's why it's important to have the deep perspectives that we got from these two experts tonight. So thank you to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to Greg. And thank you, everybody, and we'll see you again next time.